And I'm very pleased to introduce our chairman seminar speaker today, Dr. Mark Mandel. Um, I've known Mark for oh, many years, uh, I think since his uh, grad student days. He was a PhD student at UC Berkeley, got his degree in epidemiology. Uh, and I learned something new today. I knew he had worked at LBL for a number of years. I always thought of him as an LBL employee. He actually did spend 10 years at NIOSH. I thought it was two or three years. I didn't realize time flew by so quickly. But um, he's been just a real premier uh, scientist and investigator in the indoor air quality research field for many years. Um, he's done some excellent work that's really um, some very insightful work. Mark looked, for example, at all of the sick building studies uh, that were done about, what, 10 years ago, I think? 1990. 1990, OK. And um, looked at them very carefully. In the early days, we all thought sick building syndrome was due to VOC exposures. Well, Mark looked at the data across the many studies that had been done, uh, both in the US and in Europe and across the world and determined that it may not be VOCs. It looked like dust and some other factors might be responsible. Uh, so he's actually very good at, at scrutinizing data. He looks at data very carefully and does some very careful work. And um, many of us in the field see him as uh, being typically ahead of the curve. Uh, he is working at Lawrence Berkeley again now, Lawrence Berkeley Lab, and again, I think, is ahead of the curve with the work he's going to present to you today. So with that, Mark, we're pleased to have you. Go ahead. Thank you, Peggy. Um, yeah, my mic is on, I think. Um, today I'm going to present the results of a review on uh, indoor residential chemical emissions and respiratory and allergic effects in children. Um, this review was uh, supported by the Indoor Environment Division of the US EPA, and I'm grateful to them for that support. I'm also very grateful to Al Hodgson, who's helped me understand some of the, the many complexities uh, uh, of indoor chemicals. Uh, I'll start with some introductory material, uh, then try and summarize briefly the available findings from this review, talk a little bit about ventilation as a possible modifier for the effects related to indoor sources, uh, try and evaluate the overall set of findings in, in this pretty broad review. Uh, say just a little bit about some existing conditions relative to the, the risk levels identified in some of these studies, and then talk about some of the overall implications. Um, the research in the United States on respiratory health effects of indoor environments, uh, there's been a lot of it, has focused primarily on uh, allergens, such as dust mite, cockroach, and animal dander. Uh, the whole constellation of mold, uh, moisture, uh, moisture-loving bacteria, and endotoxin, and combustion products, including environmental tobacco smoke, and also uh, uh, stoves, heaters, things like that, and to some extent on outdoor pollutants, uh, especially combustion products outdoors that might penetrate indoors. But there's been research outside the United States on an entirely different set of risk factors uh, and this research has shown associations uh, between respiratory and health effects in humans and either indoor concentrations of chemicals or the presence of common indoor materials or finishes or related activities indoors. Uh, and most of this research has been in children and the strongest findings have been in children. Uh, and I haven't seen this really diverse set of findings summarized anywhere. So that's what I've attempted to do. Um, there are about 20 recent studies that I found on this topic. Uh, almost all of them are from the last 10 years, uh, 96 to 2006, all of those from Europe, and only two of them earlier, 1989 to 1990, from the United States, and both of those were on formaldehyde when people were concerned about formaldehyde in the United States. Since that day, I have not seen any studies on this topic in the from the United States at all. Uh, perhaps someone can explain to me why I, I don't really understand. So the risk factors that were identified in these studies include the presence of specific organic compounds in indoor environments. These are in residences, uh, including formaldehyde, uh, various plasticizers, 
uh, aromatic compounds such as benzene and toluene and aliphatic compounds like uh, hexane or decane. And also other risk factors were indoor finishes or materials or activities that might emit these chemicals indoors. And these would include particle board, which is a, a pressed wood product held together with a urea formaldehyde resin, uh, flexible flooring and plastics, which are generally flexible because of uh, their phthalate esters they contain, uh, new paint, carpets, or various renovation activities, uh, which might include various new materials or new surfaces. And uh, this review excludes studies on risks from environmental tobacco smoke or other combustion products indoors even though they would be chemicals as well. The outcomes associated with these risk factors in the reviewed studies include a variety of asthma-related outcomes, either, say, diagnosed asthma or um, recurrent wheeze or uh, elevated levels of exhaled nitric oxide or uh, sensitivity to dust mites, a, a whole range of outcomes, or some allergy-related outcomes, such as atopy based on skin prick tests or uh, diagnosis by a physician as an allergic uh, to specific things or um, eczema, uh, a few, few other uh, elevated IgE to specific compounds or elevated total IgE. Uh, another outcome was altered profiles of uh, cytokine secretion by different T cell subpopulations. Uh, and then the, the final risk factor I'm sorry, the final outcome that was included in these studies was increased pulmonary infections. I'm going to give you a very broad overall picture of this whole literature in two slides, very dense and condensed to start out with. This slide shows you uh, three rows. These are three of the five kinds of risk factors summarized. The first row is going to be risks associated with either measured plasticizers or the presence of plastics in residences. This row will be risks related to measured formaldehyde concentrations in indoor air or the presence of composite wood products, mostly uh, particle board, in the houses. And this will be risks associated with paint or recent painting or the activity of painting. Uh, the columns are the uh, broadly categorized outcomes. Uh, there's a a variety of asthma-related outcomes looked at in these studies and a variety of allergy-related outcomes. Uh, the, the format of this is the bold numbers are the range of odds ratios contained in each cell for studies looking at that outcome and that risk factor. And the lighter numbers are the specific odds ratios identified in each of the studies with an asterisk indicating that it had a p-value less than 0.05. So as you can see, the greatest number of findings here were for asthma-related outcomes and either plasticizers or plastics or formaldehyde or composite wood products with somewhat fewer for painter painting and the allergy and plasticizers and not, not a whole lot for allergy and formaldehyde or allergy and paint. You'll also notice that the upper range of these uh, odds ratios is fairly high uh, for asthma and plasticizers going up to almost 13, for asthma and formaldehyde going up to 8, uh, asthma and paint to 4.1, allergy and formaldehyde to 4.1, and then lower levels for these other two cells. Uh, these next two rows are, these are risks, uh, uh, elevated risks identified in relation to aromatic volatile organic compounds measured in indoor air in residences. So again, these might be benzene, toluene, styrene. Uh, and this row combines all the non-aromatic VOCs studied. So it might include aliphatic compounds, terpenes. Uh, there's the odd cyclic five-carbon ring and uh, a, few other, a few other compounds that, and, and a total VOC result and a few other things that didn't fit anywhere else. And these have the same two columns for outcomes as the previous table and an additional column for studies looking at altered T cell cytokine expression uh, and how this might be uh, um, associated with these risk factors. Here again, you see most 
of the studies in, in uh, more studies in one cell allergies and uh, aromatic VOCs, fair number in asthma related outcomes in aromatic VOCs, um, fewer outcomes in these others. You also see some very high odds ratios. Uh, this is the very highest in the whole review, and there's a lot of very high numbers in this cell, although it's not clear to me exactly how to interpret these, because uh, these are uh, showing that the uh, subpopulations, the T cells in the study uh, population were producing more cytokines considered to indicate a tilt towards the uh, TH2 phenotype, which is considered to, to indicate a, a tilt towards potential allergy or asthma. Uh, so hard to interpret, but very big numbers here. Uh, then for allergic-related outcomes and these different kinds of VOCs, the odds ratios went up to 16, which is rather substantial. Uh, for the asthma-related and aromatics, went up to 10, and uh, here it went up to 2.9. Now, the overall body of findings had a lot of findings that related one specific kind of risk factor to one specific health outcome and it wouldn't be replicated elsewhere in the body of findings. And there were many, many kinds of risk factors examined and many kinds of outcomes examined. So many of these findings are not replicated in, in, uh, within this body of studies. There were a number of risk factors that were identified in multiple studies. Uh, the ones most frequently identified were uh, measured formaldehyde or the presence of particle board, measured plasticizers or the presence of plastic materials, or uh, recent painting. And then there were some additional single findings of interest that I'll mention. Uh, there were some uh, substantial risks associated with aliphatic hydrocarbons, even though it's not exactly clear what that represents, what they'd be coming from. And there was a, an elevated risk associated with uh, uh, various aromatic compounds. Uh, and again, it's not clear what to make of that because they might come from some indoor products, uh, but they also come uh, substantially from ETS and from vehicle emissions if you have, say, uh, an attached garage or, or even a lot of uh, heavy traffic near your, your residence. Uh, I'm going to go through a few specific risk factors and their outcomes to give you a little more detail on them. Um, overall, either higher formaldehyde concentrations measured in the air of these houses or the presence of particle board was associated with a range of risk factors. The formaldehyde concentrations in these studies that were found to be associated with some increased risk of, of an adverse health outcome ranged from uh, greater than 20 up to uh, 73 micrograms per cubic meter. And later I'll give you some examples of uh, the range of concentrations of formaldehyde present in all the houses studied that you can compare to, to these, these levels above which they found some risk. And the outcomes that were associated with these risk factors included all the ones listed below. And uh, I put after each outcome the number of studies in which that was found. And so you can see that uh, there's diagnosed asthma, diagnosed chronic bronchitis, exhaled nitric oxide, which is an indication of inflammation of the lower airways. And it is higher in asthmatics, but it is not indicative specifically of asthma. Uh, presence of wheeze or frequency of wheeze, uh, some inconsistent findings on whether respiratory symptoms are increased, uh, some inconsistent findings on whether uh, changes in lung function uh, occur, and then uh, consistent findings in, in the two studies on whether uh, atopy or allergy uh, were related. And um, I'll just add a little more detail about the formaldehyde in the particle board. The fact that formaldehyde in a study is associated with a health outcome doesn't tell you that formaldehyde causes the health outcome. Uh, there can be all kinds of biases in the study that make that an artifactual finding. Uh, even if it were a perfectly designed study in every way, the fact that higher formaldehyde concentrations adjusted for all the other confounders that you know about that you've measured is still associated with the outcome still doesn't tell you that something else that you haven't measured that's highly correlated with formaldehyde might actually be causing the health effect you're seeing and not formaldehyde. So for instance, I looked a little bit into where formaldehyde comes from indoors. Uh, it does come from, I think most heavily, from pressed wood, composite wood products made with urea formaldehyde resin. 
And this is a resin which is inexpensive and transparent and apparently seen as commercially necessary to make the very large amount of composite wood products used around the world. But it has some residual formaldehyde in the product which is released after use and it has also some tendency to decompose over time, uh, long periods of time and release formaldehyde and I think this is increased in conditions of higher temperature and higher uh, humidity. And uh, among other compounds that have been found, well, among other sources of formaldehyde, there's the composite wood products, there's environmental tobacco smoke and other combustion products indoors uh, and paint, fabrics, carpets, drapes, a whole bunch of uh, other potential sources. Um, I think it's important to look into how much these all might contribute to a relationship found in residences between higher formaldehyde and health effects. I would guess that the overwhelming majority of these, uh, uh, of the formaldehyde inside will come from the wood products, but it needs to be looked into, I think, more carefully. There also are other emissions from particle board and composite wood products. So, for instance, if formaldehyde were innocent, but it was always emitted along with some toxic chemical that actually caused these effects, and you didn't know about it, you might implicate formaldehyde. But um, apparently, pressed wood products emit a large number of other aldehydes and some terpenes, uh, aldehydes including hexanol and, and others, and the other aldehydes are irritants also, and the terpenes are, uh, limonene is an example, something you might find in a cleaner, and the terpenes react with ozone to form irritant compounds like more aldehydes. So I think the answer isn't in on what a higher formaldehyde concentration associated with the health outcome means, although it may well mean something from the same source. Okay. So you should keep that in mind. Some example findings, just to give you a sense of some of the numbers in some of these uh, reports. One study looked at children who went to the hospital for emergency treatment for asthma, compared it to children who didn't need that. Uh, so it's a case control study. And they found that the probability of needing emergency treatment for asthma among children when their indoor formaldehyde concentrations at home were higher than 60 micrograms per cubic meter, the risk of needing emergency treatment for asthma increased by 39%. Or if you assume it's a, uh, a continuous uh, relationship across the whole range, an estimated 3% increased risk per 10 microgram per cubic meter increase in indoor formaldehyde concentration. Uh, another study found that if you compare categories of peak indoor formaldehyde in houses of less than 20, 20 to 50, and greater than 50 micrograms per cubic meter, the proportion of diagnosed asthmatic children in those categories of different indoor formaldehyde concentrations were 16 percent, 39 percent, and 44 percent. Uh, there was a test for trend done for that uh, set of three proportions, and it was not significant. The uh, p-value was larger than 0.05, uh, but they are very suggestive numbers. Another risk factor is either the presence of higher concentrations in dust in the houses of phthalate esters. Uh, the two that were associated with the risks were N-butyl benzyl phthalate and diethyl hexyl phthalate or just the presence of plastic materials in the houses. Those are two ways to look at the risk factor. You know, measure an emission or just look at the source and assume that it's emitting um, plasticizers. Uh, and I, I'll mention here again that a little more detail. Phthalate esters are added to some but not all plastics to make them flexible. Some plastics are flexible without uh, needing phthalate esters. Uh, Polyvinyl chloride is a very, very widely used plastic that because of the way the, the uh, molecules link tends to be rigid unless you add plasticizers to make it flexible. Uh, so all PVC products have lots of plasticizers in them. Uh, I think uh, a vinyl floor tends to be something like 40% DEHP by weight and that is continually leaving at a slow rate, leaving from the, the polyvinyl chloride. So in the studies, that I identified there were increases related to some aspect of this risk factor in 
um, diagnosed asthma, bronchial obstruction, wheeze, cough, phlegm, allergy, rhinitis, and eczema. And a little inconsistency on wheeze, but pretty much consistency on all the rest. And again, this doesn't tell you that these two plasticizers cause these health effects. It doesn't tell you that the plastic services cause the health effects. It just says they're associated. And it remains to be demonstrated more uh, concretely exactly what is going on. Another risk factor, recent painting or renovation. Um, this was not done by way of measurements. This was done by asking people, have you painted recently? Have you done renovation recently? And renovation is one of those basket uh, definitions where you can have either painted or redone your floors or redone your walls or done a few other things, most of which would have involved painting, but not, not necessarily, but I've grouped them uh, uh, because they, they are likely all to contain painting in general. And so this was associated with an increase in wheeze, obstructive bronchitis, pulmonary infections, and allergy, uh, fairly consistent. And again, it's not clear what actual um, mechanism, what emission, what exposure might be involved here, or, or, or exposures. Another risk factor was higher concentration of specific aliphatic hydrocarbon compounds. So uh, aliphatic hydrocarbons are saturated straight chain hydrocarbons like um, hexane, decane, dodecane. They are traditionally not considered to be particularly toxic, so it's a little surprising to people who, not me, people who know about these things that you should find these sorts of effects. And uh, if you study any one of these, they tend to be very strongly related to others of this type. Uh, and also, they're probably coming from sources that emit many other chemicals as well. So it's not clear what to make of this, but yet um, there were associations uh, in, in, uh, only in one study, hexane, nonane, and decane with increased food-specific IgE. I think it was milk-specific uh, milk, uh, IgE. And the same study followed up the same kids more years and found that if you had elevated food-specific IgE, you had a 30-fold risk with developing eczema. So that's some indication of why this might be of some clinical significance. Uh, and also, this same study found that the uh, T-cell subpopulations tended to produce cytokines that would tilt the child more towards a, a um, Th2 phenotype, which is considered more of an asthma-related phenotype than the Th1 phenotype. And heptane, nonane, decane, and uh, dodecane were associated with this risk. And these were the very, very high odds ratios, if you remember, up to 23. So it's not exactly clear what the clinical significance of the measuring this change in T cell cytokine expression, but the, the, uh, the risks were very large for that change. Another risk factor was higher concentrations of specific aromatic compounds. And these are not necessarily aromatic hydrocarbons. Some of these are chlorinated, uh, but they all have at least a benzene ring somewhere. And these were associated with increased asthma, food-specific IgE increased, or increased pulmonary infections. Um, and again, these are all very correlated with each other. And a lot of them come from the same sources, and a lot of them come from sources that are not indoor materials or surfaces or, or coatings. Uh, a lot of them might come from environmental tobacco smoke. They might come from automobile exhaust. Turns out in, in uh, Alaska, there are very high concentrations of benzene in the homes from the, all the vehicles and the stored fuel in the garages. When they looked at it, they were just astonished how much benzene they had in the homes. And it dwarfed what came from ETS. Uh, I will mention that styrene in the study that looked at it and found the elevated risk found that styrene was not correlated with ETS in the home. So in that study, the elevated risk from styrene may be uh, separated from uh, somehow being caused by ETS, which has many other compounds in it other than, than, than styrene or benzene. Uh, so this body of literature needs more work to figure out what questions have they actually asked or not asked about what's connected, what's not connected? How do we answer these questions better if we're going to try and make some interpretation and use of them? The, the designs of these studies ranged. Uh, there were many different kinds of designs. 
countries, sizes of study, uh, kinds of measurement, quality of measurement, they, they were just all over the map. But many of them had uh, strong designs and were, were done well generally. I want to give you one example that I find to be a study of very strong design that involved no environmental measurements at all, but just took a kind of a hypothesis-based approach to do an epidemiologic study, and, and I thought was, was a very interesting and persuasive study. Um, it was reported in two papers, one by Yoni Yakala in 1999, and one by Oi in 1999. And this was a nested case control study. They identified infants who had bronchial obstruction which I believe they used as a potential indicator of asthma in infants too young to actually diagnose asthma in. Um, this bronchial obstruction might turn out to be what later, what at the older age they would call asthma, or these might be infants who later had asthma, but you can't, between ages zero and two, diagnose an infant as, having, as being an asthmatic infant. So they did a very good job of ascertaining cases and an excellent job of validating the diagnosis of the cases, which is where a lot of studies fall down. They did a standardized environmental assessment where they had a very nicely done a priori index of child exposure to plasticizer emissions from indoor services. And this involved making a list of the eight to 10 different kinds of services you might have in a house, ranking them on the likelihood of each kind of surface of emitting plasticizers um, including in the index something about the amount of these materials and then also including um, a factor for how likely the child was to be exposed from this surface. Was it in the bedroom? Was it somewhere else in the house? So they, they had a whole set of hypotheses that they applied in constructing this index a priori. And then they also did ventilation measurements in the house to see if ventilation in the house would influence uh, the risk from these sources. Uh, and then it had a good rigorous analysis adjusting for many confounders. And they found a dose response relationship between the um, plasticizer exposure index and risk of bronchial obstruction. I if you compare the third and fourth quartiles of the uh, plasticizer exposure index to, to, to those below the median, you had risk uh, odds ratios of 1, 1.3, and 2.7. And if you interpreted it as a continuous variable with a linear increase in risk, you, you got an odds ratio of 1.6 for each unit increase on a one to eight scale across the range of the plasticizer exposure index. Uh, if you just look at presence of uh, PVC, which is polyvinyl chloride flooring, yes or no, you get an odds ratio of 1.9. And if you look at the presence of PVC wallpaper, you get no elevated risk. Uh, and so there must be something different going on between flooring and wallpaper. It's not clear what that would be. And one of the most interesting aspects, which I'll get to in a minute, is that homes in, with low ventilation rates uh, increase the risks from the plasticizer, uh, modified the risk from the presence of plasticizers. Uh, so a little background on this concept. If you have sources of indoor chemical emissions in a house, they're present, you're not measuring what's in the air, but you're, you're, you're documenting that there are sources that will produce this substance in the indoor environment, the risks from these sources would be expected to increase if the ventilation rates are lower because they would not tend to dilute what's emitted from the sources by bringing in outdoor air. Uh, and the indoor concentrations would increase at uh, lower ventilation rates and increase exposures and increase risk if there is a risk. Uh, this is a little diagram from Hal Levin showing the expected concentrations of chemical compounds in indoor environments emitted from sources in the environment as ventilation rates increase. Um, so on the horizontal axis, we have ventilation air changes per hour in HCH. On the vertical axis, we have the concentration in, say, milligrams per uh, cubic meter of this hypothetical compound emitted from the surfaces in the building. Uh, one thing to notice is at a specific ventilation rate, say 
one half an error change an hour. As the source strength increases, uh, going up here is going down one, five, ten uh, milligrams per square meter per hour, say. As the source increases, the concentration indoors at the same ventilation rate will increase. As the source strength increases, another thing to notice is that to achieve a certain level of a compound in the indoor environment, uh, you need to use different ventilation rates with stronger sources. So if you wanted to keep your concentration at uh, the level of two here, for a weak source, you could get away with uh, a quarter of an air change an hour. But for uh, this source that's uh, five times as strong, you'd need over one air change an hour. And for this much stronger source, you'd need two air changes an hour. So this is the, uh, the way we understand that indoor exposures resulting from indoor concentrations would vary with ventilation rate uh, depending on the, the, the strength of a source indoors. And Oi, in the paper I mentioned before, found that in homes with low ventilation rate, they divided the population into less than or greater than half an air change an hour, the risk of bronchial obstruction in infants associated with the presence of plasticizer emitting materials was very much higher in the homes with low ventilation. And I'll show you a chart of that. Um, this is for the plasticizer exposure index, high versus low, in homes that had high ventilation rates and were therefore removing uh, pollutants that would be in the air more rapidly, the risk for presence of uh, a lot of plasticizer emitting services was 2.6. In the homes with low ventilation rate, the odds ratio was 12.6. And just as an analogy or a, a, a parallel finding, for the presence of dampness in the houses, uh, houses with low ve high ventilation rates had an odds ratio of 2.3 for risk of bronchial obstruction if there was dampness in the house compared to if there was not dampness in the house, whereas that same comparison in houses with low ventilation rates, the risk was 9.6. So this is uh, somewhat what we would tend to predict, and it suggests a very interesting relationship between health effects indoor exposures, indoor sources, and, and ventilation rates. And it suggests to me two things, that if you're going to study risks of these uh, indoor exposures, you need to pay attention to the ventilation rate in your study, or you might obscure something. And also, if you're going to set ventilation rates for health, you need to pay attention to what the sources are and what the health effects of the exposures are from the sources. So they would go hand in hand. Um, related to this, home ventilation rates are decreasing over time. Newer houses are built ever more tightly to save energy, and older houses are continually tightened over time to save energy. And so even if sources in homes stayed unchanged and emitted the same levels of contaminants, over time, average indoor exposures should be increasing as ventilation rates decrease. And here's a chart just demonstrating the uh, decrease over time in ventilation rates in U.S. homes, or increase in air tightness. So the, the unit for, for um, air tightness in homes is normalized leakage in square meters. And from 1910 up to 1990, you can see that the, the mode for uh, leakage in these houses has gone from 0.6 down to about 0.25, and it presumably will continue to decrease, and this should be happening uh, around the world. Okay, now just an overall evaluation of what these studies, what, what to think about these studies. Um, what could explain the findings that these studies have? Uh, each study could actually be documenting a true causal relationship between the risk factor they're studying and the health effect they're studying. Or it could be that there's really a strong correlation between the outcome and some unmeasured truly causal indoor exposure. Um, for instance, benzene associated with uh, a lot of health effects in these studies. It could be that, in fact, benzene simply indicates tobacco smoke. Tobacco smoke has many, many chemicals in it that we now have harmful effects. Uh, it could be that, in fact, the study looked at benzene, but it's really a lot of other things associated with benzene coming from the same sources or activities or processes that really cause the risk. And these studies can't really deal with that question generally. You know, some of them measured a number of chemicals, but they, they didn't measure all the chemicals that, that you might 
be concerned about. Um, you could also have confounding by factors that have nothing to do with indoor factors. Uh, for instance, socioeconomic status. If, in fact, some exposure was associated with lower socioeconomic status, it might, in fact, be that that's really causing the health effect and nothing to do with the exposure. It's not immediately obvious to me how that would play a large role in these studies because it tended to be homes that were doing more renovation that tended to have the health effects. Uh, in some studies, SES is a very plausible explanation for findings, alternate explanation, but in these studies, not so much. You could also have just bias when you ask people, did you do this, did you do that, that people who have a sick child will remember more that they did this or did that if they're suspecting that this activity might be related to their child's illness. But that only applies to studies where you're asking people that information, you're not actually measuring the concentrations in the air because you wouldn't get that bias if you're measuring the concentrations in the air. Um, you could have systematic measurement error where uh, somehow systematically in houses with sick children you measure higher concentrations than really are there of what you're studying. That doesn't seem so plausible to me. And because these studies often looked at many health effects and many risk factors, you could just have chance findings when there's no real relationships just because you're asking so many questions, some of them light up, and uh, you report them and you don't report the others. And um, that certainly happens in publications in general, uh, publications that have exciting findings, you know, they get published more quickly and, or they might not ever get published at all if it's not the findings that people expect. Or if you're finding many things and only some of them are actually associations, you might report those and not report the others. So this is something that needs to be looked at in this literature. Uh, and overall, I think the answer isn't in on how to interpret these studies. Uh, my impression is that there are, uh, there are not sufficient other biases to explain away most of these findings, and mostly what's going on is you have a study which will have found uh, a valid relationship between something and the health effect, but you're not sure whether it's the relationship is really with what they actually measured or if there could be something else highly correlated with it, but that still would tend to be an indoor emission or an indoor material. That, that's my impression from the, from the literature. Me. Go the wrong way. You're right. They're both. I'm going both ways. Um, <laughs> uh, Let me see. Okay. So all of these studies reviewed were observational. Observational studies always have lots of limitations, lots of weaknesses, and so all these studies are liable to all these, these limitations. Um, I mentioned earlier there's multiple findings, findings for only a few specific risk factor health outcome associations. Uh, there's not really enough findings there to distinguish, say, risk factors for causation of asthma and risk factors for exacerbation of asthma, which is an important question, the same with allergies. Um, and often the associations reported for specific risk factors are not adjusted for some other potentially correlated uh, indoor chemical risks, uh, like benzene was not adjusted for is there an attached garage. Uh, in some studies it was uh, adjusted for ETS, but in others it wasn't. On the other hand, many of these studies were quite well designed without major flaws, and as I just said a, a minute ago, I think the major common weakness among the studies is there could be potential confounding by other unmeasured causal indoor risk factors. Um, and it, it, to me, it's difficult to identify alternative explanations for many of these studies that don't somehow involve adverse effects by some indoor chemicals, whether it's the one being studied or, or, or another one. Um, and my impression from looking at these studies is that the most persuasive findings, which is found in the most studies, the most consistent, uh, with an absence of plausible alternative explanations that are correlated with the risk factors I studied, would be formaldehyde and particle board. The next most persuasive findings would be for plastics and plasticizers and new paint, for the same reasons. And then other findings 
are, are suggestive. The, the aliphatic hydrocarbons had some highly elevated risks. They wouldn't be expected to have those risks, and so it seems most plausible that there are some other exposures closely correlated with aliphatic hydrocarbons indoors that might actually be responsible. And I don't know much about other sources. The Europeans, one European study found that new painting was associated with a substantial increase in aliphatic hydrocarbon concentrations in indoor air. Um, my chemical expert here, Al Hodgson, said this is not true in the United States, and he thinks that aliphatic hydrocarbons indoors are much more likely to come from things like caulk, um, glues, and things than paint. Um, the dichlorobenzene, I would have thought of as um, an aromatic compound that would be correlated with many others, but Al Hodgson pointed out to me that it tends to come from just a couple of kinds of sources, things like um, bathroom deodorizers, if you see these uh, little cakes of things that slowly give off a smell and, and some people think they deodorize a room, those are dichlorobenzene. That's the kind of place you might find them. Um, and those objects are made almost entirely of dichlorobenzene. So that is an, uh, a, a, an example of where there's not a lot of obvious other correlated exposures that could explain the association of dichlorobenzene with an increase in diagnosed asthma. As to how, how these exposures might actually cause health effects, it's not clear. Um, some can uh, cause respiratory tract inflammation uh, from aldehyde, obviously. For instance, uh, there is some, uh, a theory that phthalates may have prostaglandin-like inflammatory activity in the lungs because they have a chemical structure similar to prostaglandins. That, that's a, an idea from OI. Uh, a uh, Danish study has shown that inhalation of low levels of phthalates increase exhaled nitric oxide, which again isn't uh, an indicator of inflammation of the lower airways. Uh, there's animal studies showing that formaldehyde, for instance, can produce increased sensitization in a non-inflammatory way. Uh, and other studies uh, in this review suggest a possibility that some chemicals might have a direct effect on the developing immune system and orient it in a direction making someone more susceptible to allergy or asthma. missing a slide. Uh, well, I'm not sure how that happened, but I had a couple of slides comparing the, uh, the levels associated with increased risk in some of these studies, and then the levels actually found in the homes, in the studies. Uh, so I'll give it to you from here. I think it's on the handout. Yeah. Oh, okay, so whoever has a handout, it's slide number 36, um, and it shows that uh, in five studies, the uh, median concentrations of formaldehyde were about 20, mean concentrations of formaldehyde were about 30, and maximum concentrations were about 150, 200. And the uh, levels associated with increased risk in these studies range from about 20 up to about 73. So if, in fact, risks increase at some level between 20 and 73, and if, in fact, homes have median or mean concentrations of 20 to 30, and this is micrograms per cubic meter, then we have many houses at which there would be increased risk in the general population. These are studies from Australia and the United States. And then for phthalates, um, the level above which there was increased risk for asthma or allergy for butyl benzyl phthalate was greater than 0.25 milligrams per gram of dust, and the 90th percentile in the population was about 0.28 milligrams per gram. So the risk level was at around the 90th percentile. And so if, if there were a causal association, 10% of the population would, would have that increased risk. For diethylhexyl phthalate, which is, is the uh, 
compounds that make up about 40 percent of, of uh, PVC flooring. The elevated risk was found at greater than 0.13 milligrams per gram of dust, uh, and the median concentration in dust in, in uh, houses measured was 0.34. So the risk level was way below the median, so if there is a causal relationship there, you would have uh, most of the houses would be uh, the, uh, of levels at levels at, at greater risk. So, overall, this body of uh, studies suggest that some common materials and emissions in modern homes, either the ones studied or others closely uh, correlated with them, are associated with adverse respiratory and allergic health effects in infants and children. The findings seem most persuasive for formaldehyde, strongly suggestive for plastics, plasticizers, and new paint, and suggestive for some other risk factors. Uh, the use of these products is likely to increase, and ventilation rates in homes are likely to decrease. Uh, so exposures are likely to increase, and any true adverse effects going on here are likely to increase over time in homes uh, in the developed world. Uh, and it's not clear what causal connections could be uh, really happening, what the biologic mechanisms might be, and what the role of all these risk factors might be in the recent rise of asthma and allergies uh, that's worldwide. And these questions are receiving absolutely no research attention in the United States that I've been able to identify. I, I don't know why. I think it's important to confirm or disprove these relationships that have been suggested in all these studies. And if, in fact, these ubiquitous home exposures do increase the risk of preventable serious respiratory health effects in children, it would be very important to identify what the causal exposures are, to quantify the risks in order to motivate more research and, uh, uh, or consumer choice or policies and then to identify effective preventive strategies so, could, so they could be implemented. Uh, and that is my last slide, so thank you. Uh, would, uh, I would be glad to take questions from here, and I think there might be questions off the web as well. Right. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Mendel. That was very, um, very interesting. And, um, just before we take questions, I wanted to ask you to, if you could just explain very quickly um, odds ratios, because there may be some people that aren't real clear on that, just briefly, and then how the odds ratios in these studies compare to odds ratios you see typically in other epidemiology studies with significant findings. So I think one of the things that you had said, <clears throat> excuse me, in, your, um, in a prior presentation was to put that into perspective. I think that would be very helpful. Okay. Thank you. Um, odds ratios are an estimate of the strength of association between some risk factor and some, some outcome that epidemiologists use because a certain kind of very convenient model produces them, even though they're not very easy to understand if you're not an epidemiologist or a statistician. Um, I, I guess without getting into the technical details, if you look at uh, people who are exposed to something and you want to find out if they have an increased risk, if they have an odds ratio of one, it means the odds ratio of their having the, I'm sorry, it means the ratio of the odds of their having this disease if they have this exposure versus their odds if they don't have the exposure is one, which means there's no increased risk. So one is essentially no increased risk. It's roughly equivalent to a relative risk, which you may have heard in a lot of other contexts where if your relative risk is two, you have double the risk uh, as if you compared to if you didn't have this exposure. Uh, and so you can roughly think of it as a relative risk. Um, so if you have an odds ratio of 10, you have roughly 10 times the risk of having this outcome compared to if you weren't exposed to, to the particular risk factor involved. Um, and so in most studies I've been involved in, uh, odds ratios or relative risks are one and a half, two, two and a half, three. So these are very big odds ratios, very big increased risks. They're very eye-opening. And as I keep saying, it's not exactly clear what they mean. It's not exactly clear what is being implicated. But uh, there's such big increases in risk that they tend to make bias 
much less likely as an explanation. The, the standard um, description of what something has to be to be a confounder you don't know about that really explains the way the finding you do have is it has to be something that uh, has at least as strong an association with the outcome and is highly correlated with what you're studying. So if you, if you have an odds ratio of 10 for something and it's not really the causal factor, whatever really is a causal factor, it has to have an odds ratio of more than 10 and be very, very strongly correlated with what you're studying. So a lot of epi studies that you see will have a, uh, elevated risks, 1.5, 1.25, and it's very easy for many small things, you know, socioeconomic status, gender, pre-existing illness, to explain away completely a finding you have. Whereas when you have odds ratios of, uh, of 3 or 5 or 10, it's much less likely that there's something you know nothing about that fully explains away what you're finding. Okay. There we go. In slide 27, um, it shows an increased odds ratio um, for low ventilation, which sounds like that's 12 times the risk. Um, what is your definition of high ventilation versus low ventilation, and are there any recommended rates to decrease risk? Um, presumably, if there is a relationship, it would be continuous. Um, this particular study just split everyone into two groups, above and below one half of an air change per hour. I, I believe that's often considered a minimum acceptable ventilation rate. Uh, I, I, the levels may be lower, lower now, but uh, that's, that's a common minimum ventilation rate that people will sometimes mention for, for a new housing. O old houses tend to be much more ventilated than that, but when you start making houses very tight, they, they uh, you get down in that range. So low ventilation, in this study, the, the elevated risks are associated with ventilation rates lower than one half air change per hour. But if this is a real relationship, you might assume that as ventilation gets lower down to that, the risk is, is increasing up to that. Right, I think Mark was excuse me, saying it's a continuous relationship, so you're gonna, they're gonna parallel each other, they're gonna coincide. Yeah, there wouldn't be a sharp cutoff between wonderful and terrible. Right. Uh, thank you, actually I have two questions. The first is I'm presuming you're familiar with the California Air Resources Board indoor air quality report that they put out recently. Uh, anyway, two. Correct. I'm less familiar than I would like to admit here. Well, yes. I'm sure they get you a coffee. Um, but two of the most um, significant risk factors they found in that report were environmental tobacco smoke, secondhand environmental tobacco smoke, and radon. And it seemed to me that in a lot of these studies you indicated that they did not always include those sorts of confounding factors. They would never, that be correct? Never included radon in any of these studies, and some adjusted for ETS. Okay, thank you. Um, and the second thing that really struck me from your presentation is that it's, it's very complex. There's a number of things that could be confounding factors, um, but it was clear that there was this enormous improvement with increased ventilation rates, regardless of what the, the connection is. And would it make sense that as studies go forward, shouldn't that be a key area to focus on to get the message out to people to increase ventilation, regardless of of these other findings because that seems to be a significant improvement. A good question, a very complex issue. Um, almost no one has looked at this question in research studies. This study did. They found a, a very strong relationship between lower ventilation rate and increased risk if you have sources. Uh, one other study looked at the same thing, didn't report anything about how they did it or their data or findings but said it didn't matter. So I, I don't know exactly what that means, but if you take them at their word, there's one study that found this modification from ventilation and one did not. Uh, I know this study did very good ventilation measurements. Most studies would not do ventilation measurements that, that well. So I, I don't really know how good of a counter argument the other study is. It, it's not, the data aren't available. Um, higher ventilation would in fact lower the indoor exposures to emissions 
of many indoor compounds, but not all, and then there's, there, there's a variety of issues. Um, among the issues are some compounds put out semi-volatile, I'm sorry, some sources put out semi-volatile compounds, which would tend not to be so much airborne as uh, sorbed to dust, and the ventilation rate might not be as effective in lowering those exposures. Some sources emit more when ventilation rates are higher because they're in a, an equilibrium between the concentration of the compound in the air and the concentration in the, in the material. And radon, I believe, I've heard different stories on this, but radon may be one of those substances where if you ventilate a crawl space, more may come from the soil because you're lowering the concentration of radon in the air right above the soil. So that's something to think about. And then there's the further complexity that outdoor concentrations of whatever you don't like will be increased indoors when you increase indoor, uh, uh, indoor outdoor ventilation rates. For instance, there's formaldehyde in outdoor air. Uh, so if you were, it would actually be a pretty complex calculation to decide uh, if you increase ventilation because you have formaldehyde emitting sources indoors, how much will you be changing the emission rate of the sources indoors? Uh, how much will you be removing by ventilation, and how much will you be introducing from outdoors by ventilation? So it's all complicated. Thank you. So um, yeah, ventilation helps, but maybe isn't the complete solution. Oh, absolutely. There. The best solution Definitely. is source removal, source okay. substitution. And one, one clarification, I think, um, maybe when you were asking about radon not being measured in, in these studies, but radon is not known to contribute to asthma or the, right. the health effects here. It's just known mainly for the uh, lung cancer, I think, is the, yeah, the health no, effect no of no. point to adjusting for radon in these studies because it, it would be yeah. an irrelevant exposure. I wasn't sure if you were asking because you thought it would be associated or not. So, right, right. Any other questions here in the audience? I better bring you the microphone. Huh? Uh, Mark, um, I'm trying to understand the effect of humidity or dampness on the uh, risk as far as the odds. Physically, what increases the odds in a damp environment? Is the source higher in a damp? Is more emitted in a damp environment than a um. less damp? I think that's considered a very important, very uh, mysterious question these days because there have been many, many studies documenting over and over that increased dampness and moisture in homes is associated with increase of many respiratory health outcomes. And when they actually try to measure microorganisms uh, more specifically, they generally don't find relationships as strong, even though people have often assumed that the dampness is a risk factor really because it's allowing microorganisms to grow indoors and leading to microbial exposures. Um, one alternate, ex well, the, the, the most obvious explanation to that set of findings is that the microbiologic exposures that have the adverse health effects aren't the ones we've measured with our, with our old fashioned, uh, perhaps somewhat useless culture-based microbial measurement methods. Uh, and it could be other microbiological exposures involved. But, but this body of literature also suggests an, another alternative, which is that moisture might be related to increased chemical exposures in homes. Uh, for instance, I think relative humidity in the air is strongly related to emission rate of formaldehyde from uh, composite wood products, because I believe the, it, there's a decomposition, actually, of, of the the resin, the urea formaldehyde resin at higher temperature and humidity. So houses with more moisture would tend to have more formaldehyde in the air. Uh, there's also some studies showing that moisture tends to degrade uh, polyvinyl fluoride flooring leading, and the plasticizers leading to the emissions of some compounds from them. And so that's another possible uh, explanation that would not be microbiologic from, uh, between, for a relationship between higher moisture and, and, and health effects. Thank you. Any other questions? Not to belabor the point, but just as a follow-up, do you know why environmental tobacco smoke wasn't considered? Was it, 
in some uh, of the well studies? I, I omitted it from the review because okay. there's lots of people working on that. This was uh, a review of chemical uh, sealants, materials, uh, not combustion products. It, and I understand that. And the, the question is, so if you had a home with smokers, would they be excluded from the study or would they be included in the study and the tobacco risk would just somehow be accounted for or was that just not looked at? In most of these studies, they assessed whether someone in the house smoked, included it as a potential confounding variable in the model and adjusted for it. In one or two studies, they did not. Um, after thinking about it, I believe that adjusting for environmental tobacco smoke in these studies is not enough. Um, I, I believe that if in fact you're measuring benzene and you're adjusting for environmental tobacco smoke and there's real risk from other things in tobacco smoke that are highly correlated with benzene and you simply adjust for environmental tobacco smoke, you are still going to be distorting your estimate of risk for benzene by the risk of all these other components of environmental tobacco smoke. And you could only really get a handle on that properly by either omitting entirely any homes with environmental tobacco smoke or doing a completely separate stratified analysis and looking at the risk of increased benzene separately in homes with and without smokers. Because when you simply adjust for it, you're averaging the two, and I believe that would not be sufficient. Thank you. Other questions here in the audience? Richard? So I was just wondering, why do you think there are so few studies coming out of the U.S. on these? And kind of related to that, are these mostly, I'm assuming they're mostly coming out of Europe? Is that where the studies are? And why is Europe so interested? Um, I have no idea why there's nothing from the United States. I don't even know whom to ask. Um, uh, the studies in the review, uh, two from the United States in 1989 and 90 on formaldehyde, and then they stopped completely. The others are from one group in Australia that's really interested in, in asthma, um, a group in Germany that's really interested in, um, they're doing prospective studies on respiratory and allergic health in infants and various household exposures. And then Yoni Akala, who has been in multiple countries, uh, Britain, Finland, Sweden, Norway, Russia, he's done a host of the other studies. And I think that's all of the groups doing this research. It's not even broadly throughout Europe. Yeah, this is a pretty new area of investigation, wouldn't you say? I mean, just in general. Yeah, well, except so. for the formaldehyde interest back in the late 80s in the United States, these all started, there's one in 96, but all the others were from mm -hmm. 1999 up to the present. So it's quite new. Right, so but this even is as new as it is. Pretty new. No one has paid any attention to it. I, you know, mm -hmm. I, I don't see the studies as being so so deeply flawed that they should be dismissed. So I don't understand why I never mm -hmm. hear any attention being given to this by anyone in the United States. Mm -hmm. Any other questions here, Steve? Um, do we have any on the web? No. Okay. So we have a few more minutes. If anybody, any last comments, questions. Even if you've already asked one, you can <laughs> I could see that coming. <laughs> well, just as you were talking about the countries where these studies have been performed, I noticed that those are all chilly countries, if you will. And I'm just wondering if climate chilly? plays in chilly, as in cold. Um, if, if climate plays any role in that um, with ventilation or, or with any other. Well, I think anyone in the indoor air field knows that the Scandinavians or the Nordic countries, had a, a very early, the, the earliest interest in, in issues of indoor air quality than anyone else, probably because they had such tight buildings so early and are very conscientious people and wanted to make sure that that was not causing any problems. Um, and uh, Germany was not actually involved in indoor air research early at all, but this is just a particular research group in Leipzig. Uh, I don't know how chilly it is in Leipzig. Uh, which is doing, has two studies, which includes all of these findings. It's not Germany generally, it's not northern Germany. I, I, I'd love to have an explanation for why these particular places and nowhere in the United States. I think Germans in general, though, have been looking at building material emissions 
I think, what before we did, really. There's been some early research there. Um, <clears throat> they've had kind of that long-term interest. They've actually had materials guidelines uh, for a number of years, so I think that may be, they've, they've had a little preceding interest, I think, before our interests became heightened, yeah. too. But in Australia is, I guess it depends on the part of Australia, that's warm or cool, depending on where, so. Anything else? Any questions? Okay, we'll, well throw, thank you. Let me throw out one more comment real quick. Go right ahead. Um, sure. Just from having observed the indoor air research world, the early concerns were for uh, nonspecific symptoms, sick building syndrome, that kind of problem. Uh, and then there's been a lot of concern about asthma from the allergens and, and, and such, and then recently about outdoor pollutants coming indoors. But the idea that chemicals indoors would not just be irritants and cause symptoms, but would cause respiratory and allergic effects, that's kind of a radical idea. And it may be that it's such a radical idea that it is why it isn't heard in, in some countries. Okay, well thank you very much. We sure appreciate your coming. And one more. Yeah. And if you have any follow-up questions, let us know or feel free to, to contact Dr. Mandel. I know he'd be glad to answer them. Thank you.